thank you all for joining us tonight for this this um, talk, part of our international lecture series. We are pleased to feature a special presentation by Maria Lind, director of Tenstack Konstal in Stockholm. The international lecture series is a vital, long-running program of the power plant, which invites the most dynamic artists, curators, critiques, and others from around the globe to present their work and ideas to Toronto audiences. Tonight's lecture was made possible through the very generous support of our 2015-16 lead donors, Nancy McCain and Bill Morneau, and I really want to thank them for their continued support. And uh, pleased to know that all our public programs at the power plant are generously supported by our primary education sponsor, CIBC. As always, I'd like to thank our partners at Harborfront Centers. And all lectures in this series, as well as all of our other programs, are free to members and their guests. So we encourage you to become a member of the power plant to take advantage of this, one of the many benefits of membership. Lastly, I would also like to thank BMO for supporting our all-year, all-free access to the exhibitions and also thank our institutional supporters, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council and the Toronto Arts Council. I would like now to introduce our uh, very own Christine Bowen, our Curator of Education and Public Programs, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you very much. So thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. It's so nice to be with you in this space. And I'd like to thank the artists Lizbeth Bick and Joss Vanderpool for creating such a welcoming environment and allowing us to hold this program within your exhibition. So thank you. Um, as you know, all of the exhibitions this season curated by Julia Pauli feature work by artist collectives or artists working together. And we thought there was no one better to speak on contemporary collaborative practices than renowned curator Maria Lind. And we are so grateful that she accepted our invitation to be with us tonight. Um, she led a workshop yesterday on this topic with exhibiting artists Lizbeth Bick, Joss Vanderpool, and Nadia Bellarique, all of whom I'd like to thank for your participation in yesterday's conversation. Tonight, Lind will discuss her current work at Tensta Kunstal in Stockholm, where she has been director since 2011. Previously, she has served as director of the Graduate Program Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College and as director of IASPIS in Stockholm, as well as director of Kunstverein in Munich, curator at Moderna Musit in Stockholm, and co-curator of Manifesta II. Responsible for Moderna Musit project, Lind worked with artists on a series of 29 commissions and also curated What If? Art on the Verge of Architecture and Design, and guest curated the group exhibition Abstract Possible, the Tamayo Take at Museo Tamayo in Mexico City. She is the co-editor of the books Curating with Light Luggage and Collected Newsletter, Taking the Matter into Common Hands, Collaborative Practices in Contemporary Art, and in the fall of 2010, selected Maria Lind writing was published by Steinberg Press. In 2009, she received the Walter Hopps Award for Curatorial Achievement. We are so pleased that she is with us here tonight, so please join me in giving a warm welcome to Maria Lind. Tonight I'm going to uh, shower you with images uh, from Tensta Konstal under the title of In the Midst of Working with and Around uh, Tensta Konstal. If you would have uh, come to Tensta Konstal today, uh, it would probably have looked like this. You would have seen uh, a table in front of the entrance of the exhibition space with a number of uh, people sitting down, moving around, doing things uh, to do with textile and craft. They would be young, they would be old, men, but mostly women. Um, some of them would try out techniques that they had never heard of before, like lace making, or uh, more expansive uh, crafts practices which uh, also move out into public space surrounding the art center. 
The Art Porch is uh, an initiative that we uh, started last summer and this year we are doing it in collaboration with the Swedish Craft Association. So it's a drop-in activity. Anybody who feels like sitting down, uh, doing things with your hand, primarily through textile but also just drawing, if that's your interest, is welcome to do so. And it's been uh, an asset to do it with some volunteers from the Swedish Craft Association who, of course, have uh, long-standing um, practice and experience from doing these things uh, before. If you would then go through the cafe, you would enter the reception area and you would see a small exhibition by Mats Adelman, an artist who graduated from the renowned art school in Malmö in the south of Sweden about 10 years ago and who now actually happens to live in Tensta and who has a studio uh, nearby. Ever since he went to art school, he's been interested in the borders between the city and the countryside, the kind of spaces that look abandoned, um, industrial areas or deserted houses. And there is some of that surrounding the neighborhood of Tensta as well. And if you venture even further inside, this is what you would see. Uh, a big exhibition space, about 500 square meters, with the exhibition Here We LTTR 2002 till 2008. LTTR uh, is a queer feminist uh, art collective that was active between 2002 and 2008 in New York. And they came together uh, to form um, a kind of um, issue-specific community, uh, wanting to filter the energies and the pleasures that were part of this community at the time. And that happened primarily through a journal. So over the course of six years, the journal with the same name, LTTR, came out with five issues. LTTR can stand for Lesbians to the Rescue, but also listen, translate, translate, record. Lacan teaches to read, or even lesbians tend to read. <laughs> In the exhibition, which is a collaboration with the uh, Stockholm-based architect Sara Brolund de Carvalho, there is a landscape-type furniture um, made in the same DIY manner as the journal itself. You can climb it and you can uh, flick through photocopied versions of the journals. Some of them are sold out, so you cannot really touch them. Um, the few copies that are left of the remaining issues are displayed in various ways in the exhibition space, for example on these suspended uh, shelves. And here you see uh, one of the issues, and this particular issue, they've kept so many copies that it was actually possible to have every spread visible throughout the exhibition space on the suspended uh, shelves. So if you walk through the space, you can literally read the whole issue. LTTR often organized events around uh, the journal, in conjunction with the uh, releases, for example, and they tended to produce clothes, um, tote bags, uh, posters, other things um, that you can easily uh, make through silk screen printing or the like, and which they also sold. Um, and the magazine was sold at a different rate depending on your economy as a buyer, so uh, more expensive for collectors, for instance, and, and uh, less expensive for peers. Throughout the exhibition, we are organizing a number of what we have called personalized walkthroughs. As a way of activating the content of the journal, it is in fact a rather hermetic um, gesture to show uh, five issues of a journal, to make that the core of an exhibition. Um, but the material, the content is extremely rich and uh, we thought that asking people who literally were involved with LTTR at the time or who are part of similar discourses 
for example in Sweden, but not having any contact with LTTR at the time could also contribute to interesting readings of this material. So what you see here is um, one person from the first category, namely the artist Alison Smith, who contributed to a couple of the different issues. She came to um, the opening weekend and she led one of those walkthroughs, which was uh, very funny, I have to say. Uh, the following one was um, made by a, a Stockholm-based artist who had not known of LTTR until uh, a couple of years ago and who did um, a sort of reading, collaborative reading with a young queer poet living in Tensta. So this is the place, uh, Tensta Konsthall. It was uh, founded in 1998 as um, a grassroots initiative, an artist called Gregor Wroblewski and his friends who lived and worked in the neighborhood felt a need to have more continuous activities around contemporary art. They located this space, um, storage space, underneath um, a shopping mall, which is located at the center of this neighborhood. And uh, at the same time in 1998, the municipality had a regeneration scheme running where certain suburbs uh, were given the opportunity to apply for money for initiatives that came from citizens uh, themselves. And different working groups were formed around various ideas and the biggest working group in Tensta was actually the one wanting to have a contemporary art center, which I find pretty amazing. So it quickly beca became a foundation, a private foundation, which is primarily publicly funded um, by the municipality, the state and a tiny bit from the region. And altogether, this makes up about half of our budget, and the rest we have to generate ourselves. Uh, nowadays, our annual budget is around um, 100,000 euros, or something like 150,000 Canadian dollars, something like that. And Tensta, what is that? It is this neighborhood. It's located about 20 minutes northwest of Stockholm on the subway. It's uh, a late modernist housing estate, constructed between 1967 and 1972 as part of an ambitious um, scheme um, across country, a national scheme uh, whose purpose it was to improve the, at the time, rather poor housing conditions. Between 1965 and 1975, one million housing units were built across Sweden, and it's called the Million Dwelling Program. For a small country, which at the time had around five million inhabitants, it was a huge undertaking. And in one go, um, housing became much better Prior to this, it was not unusual to live in the city center of Stockholm and not having your own bathroom in your apartment, not even a toilet in your apartment, but you would have to go uh, down in the basement and in some cases to an outhouse in the courtyard. And this is the early 60s. So Tensta is the biggest single area within the Million Dwelling Program. Um, they built around 5,600 um, apartments at the time. Uh, today, nearly 20,000 people live here. 90% uh, have a translocal background. It has obviously always been a place where people have moved in because it's a new development. And uh, in the late 60s, it was primarily people moving from the city center wanting these much nicer um, dwellings. Um, but also people from the countryside of Sweden, so uh, domestic uh, labor migrants, you could say. And from the 70s onwards, different waves of refugees and other kinds of migrants came. And um, right now, 90% um, with a translocal background, many of whom uh, have a background in the Middle East. So there is a large... Um, uh, community from uh, Turkey, uh, Kurds, uh, from Iraq, and a steady influx right now of people from Syria. There's also uh, a big group uh, coming from Somalia. 
certainly this was not a clean slate. It was farmland. And it was farmland which has a long history. The church that you can see here is located in the middle of the neighborhood. And it's uh, the oldest stone building in the region of Stockholm. So it's older than the old town of Stockholm itself. So I like the fact that there is quite a historical arc uh, right around us at the Konsthall. So it used to be farmland. Um, most of the buildings were torn down to give uh, space to the new neighborhood. A few have been kept, so you can see contrasts like this one here and there. And those buildings that have been kept, the old ones, um, they're often used by local associations or as uh, preschools or things like that. So, the program at Tensta Konstal from the beginning, from 1998, um, has been um, international and uh, the remit has always also been to have a local presence in the neighborhood. This has been interpreted in different ways by the different uh, directors and the different teams. Um, the teams have always been small. Right now uh, it consists of six uh, full-time people, including myself. Um, and the way we are interpreting this is to work with what we think is the best in contemporary art uh, from many parts of the world, including Sweden, um, and to try and mediate these projects in ways that can make sense in Tensta. This entails an, an enormous amount of doing things together. Whether we can call it collaboration or not is a further question that we uh, dwelled upon a bit yesterday. But we, on a daily basis, do things together with different groups, formal associations, organizations, workplaces, etc. And I'll try and describe some of, you, some of this as I go along in the presentation. Um, as a curator, for me, it has always been important to work closely with artists and to, as a component of the activities, have uh, the possibility of making new work. And within the framework of the project, um, the new model, this has been possible. The first commission within the project, the new model, was made by Stockholm-based artist Magnus Bertos, and you can see a still from that commission here, called The Miracle in Tensta Theoria. Uh, the Miracle in Tensta is based on an event that happened in August of 2013 in the Syrian Orthodox Church in Tensta, when Virgin Mary appeared. First, she appeared in the clouds outside. And uh, a girl captured this with her mother's cell phone and sent the images um, on social media. Uh, it exploded. Uh, there was a report in the daily newspaper the day after, which also contributed to the fact that the following day, hundreds of people came to this very church, and then Virgin Mary appeared again, this time in the fog on the windows. And this was a big event uh, for this congregation, and eventually it has actually been uh, designated an official miracle the way certain churches can, can uh, ascribe that status to a miracle. What Magnus Bertos did with this uh, event, which he happened to read about in the daily newspaper, was that he followed the threads of exchange online about the event for months. There was no more mention in mainstream media, but the discussions went on among people who actually really believed what happened, but also people who were total skeptics. And he condensed um, these exchanges online into eight, let's see, is it eight, two, four, six, no, seven characters, uh, who uh, became representatives from dif for different positions in relation to the event. He invited, um, the same number of people who in some way um, are connected to Tensta, they either live there or they work there, and ask them to uh, enact his script, which was done in the smaller space that we have where the film was uh, planned to be screened. So what you see here is when they're uh, 
doing their chorus of softly spoken um, uh, phrases in dialogue with one another. Teoria comes in because of uh, the original meaning of the word. In ancient Greece, to do a teoria was to go somewhere, experience something, for instance, go to the Olympic Games, and then return to your home village and to retell this, what you have experienced, to share uh, what you had seen and done with uh, a particular group of people. It was uh, a performative act. You were doing a teoria. So for um, Magnus Bertos, uh, this film is um, something like that. It's uh, a sort of uh, account of something that happened that meant a lot to a certain group of people, but was considered meaningless or even ridiculous by many others. The bigger framework, the new model, uh, is an, a multi-year project that I'm curating together with Lars Bang Larsen, a curator uh, nowadays based in Copenhagen. Uh, for a number of years he's been interested in this project called The Model, which happened at the Modern Museum in Stockholm in 1968. The artist Palle Nilsen uh, was invited to do a project and he pulled in friends who were uh, urban activists and they transformed the big exhibition space of the museum into an adventure playground for children. Um, as you can see, there was a big structure to climb on and then you could jump into this uh, pool of foam. There were clothes uh, from the opera, costumes from the opera to use. You could play music, you could paint, you could um, work with wood, etc. Uh, for Palle Nilsen and his collaborators, uh, this was about visions for a different kind of society. The full title of the project was The Model uh, a model for a qualitative society. Here you can see the exhibition poster. And the answer for them to what a qualitative society can be was to look at children. Um, a rather naive uh, response we can say today, but at the time it was a very powerful one. Uh, but now when uh, not only children's lives, but all lives are economized and, and um, dramatically changed. It's not as easy uh, when we want to think about what a qualitative society can be. And that is what Lars Bang Larsen and I wanted to do, to ask the question about a qualitative society from the point of view of today and from the point of view of Tensta. So we gathered a group of four artists uh, to come to Tensta. Um, and this happened in the fall of 2011. Here you can see us having a meeting in the so-called model apartment in one of the buildings in the neighborhood, which is uh, run by the City Museum of Stockholm. It's furnished the way it looked when the first family moved in, in 1969. Actually, they managed to track down some of the furniture that that family had had there. And uh, it's meant to be used. So. Um, after having been rather um, underused for many years, we figured out that we could actually get a key and that they would be happy for the Konsthal to use this apartment as a meeting space, a seminar room, etc. So we've been doing so for um, a number of years and this was one of the first occasions where we continuously um, used the apartment. The four artists are Dave Halfish Bailey, based in Los Angeles, Magnus Bertos, um, Anne Jortgutu, based in uh, Oslo, and Hito Steyr, who is not uh, in the picture because she was not there. Uh, the project, the new model, also involved um, a number of seminars looking back at the project from 1968. And it was important to bring Palle Nilsson to Stockholm to hear him talk about this rather legendary um, exhibition. Um, but it was equally important to invite the lady in the middle, Gunilla Lundahl, because she has consistently been written out of the story uh, about the model. It was actually a Gunilla Lundahl, who made the whole project possible. But when Lars Bang Larsen 
has made his research on the project, he has primarily used Palle Nielsen as his source of information, and he hasn't been particularly keen on sharing um, those details. But um, through this project, it is no longer possible to deny uh, what she has contributed in the project. The new model has also included a group show that Lars Bang Larsen uh, curated called um, The Society Without Qualities, which also had a work by Anne Jortgutte, who eventually made a new commission as well. So this is an example of a multi-year project where we decided from the beginning we don't have to uh, determine an end date. It can go on as long as, as necessary. And the final artist project, Hito Steil's work, which will eventually not be a commission because she's too busy, but which is an existing work, will be shown in the fall. And then I think the round off will be coming next year when we are making a publication. We're an underfunded institution, like many others. So doing things with others uh, is uh, fun, it's often more rewarding, but it's also very useful in terms of uh, increasing budgets and increasing muscles in terms of labor and, and workforce. Um, this uh, one-day performance, T451, by Dominic Gonzalez Furster and uh, Ari Benjamin Myers, was a collaboration with the small department of the municipality responsible for art in public space. They had some extra money kicking around for a temporary project. And they approached us and it turned out that doing something with these two amazing artists could be possible. And it became a four hour performance starting in the city center uh, in the famous library by Gunnar Asplund from the mid-twenties with a um, um, concert, I would say, uh, all referring to Ray Bradbury's novel Fahrenheit 451, but even more so uh, Truffaut's film uh, by the same name from 1966. So the performance restaged a number of the scenes from the film and used the musical score by Bernard Herrmann as a red thread. So starting in the library uh, with the uh, concert around 100 but growing to 150 people went down in the subway, uh, were given this program. Uh, you can probably glimpse that there are drawings in the program, uh, no text at all. The story in the book and in the film is of course that in a future society books are banned because books are dangerous. So uh, the role of the fire brigade is not to put out fires but uh, to burn books. So in terms of collaboration, um, we found um, an association of retired firemen who were happy to uh, locate uh, an antique fire engine for us and then the local boxing club in Tensta uh, was happy to to serve as extras um, as firemen uh, and that became one of the most striking scenes uh, in the performance. We couldn't burn books, that was a bit too uh, dangerous in public space so instead the books were sprayed with with uh, colored water. How many has, have seen uh, the film? Yeah, some. Uh, then you probably remember that it ends with um, a scene in the forest with people walking around among the trees uh, talking to themselves. They are reciting uh, famous uh, novels because that is the only way to save literature. That's the only way to rescue uh, what is otherwise banned. So the last part of the performance was a similar scene in one of the little forests between the houses in Tensta where uh, people had actually learned sections of Don Quixote or The Idiot or other very famous uh, pieces of literature, uh, walking around. It, it was and still is one of the most um, gripping um, artworks that I've experienced. So that's an example of something uh, that happened 
through the organization, through the infrastructure, through of us, but also through collaboration with another organization. Um, at the same time, we're also doing straightforward exhibitions in the space, like this one, uh, two summers ago, with the man Issa, a solo show, uh, very much looking at um, memory and the capacity to remember. Um, and it consisted of uh, uh, photography, video, sculpture, and uh, other objects. And in this case, when it comes to mediation, I said that we're trying to mediate uh, work in ways that can make sense in Tensta. In this case, it was really modest, but quite, quite um, interesting. And I don't know if I can use the word efficient. That's maybe not correct. Um, because I Iman is uh, in this project, uh, drew a bit on um, autobiographies of uh, Arab intellectuals. Uh, describing their childhood and their formative years in places like Beirut, Cairo, uh, Baghdad, etc. Uh, for example, the autobiography of Edward Said, but also the, the fiction writer Nawal El Sadawi. Uh, we thought that it would be interesting to have very um, basic guided tours in Arabic. Uh, targeting uh, groups in Tensta that speak Arabic and might have an interest in this. And it turned out to be primarily the Women's Center, which I will return to in a moment. So, on the ground, what does it mean to, to um, work in Tensta? When I started in 2011, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to hire a new team, which meant that we were all newcomers in a sense. We had to get to know the people and the, the place. I had been in Tensta as a kid because my great grandmother moved there in 1978. Um, I had also uh, gone there regularly after the Constal was opened in 1998. So that's my relationship to the place. The others had maybe visited the art center a few times, but that was it. So we started uh, with something that goes on still, which is to dislocate staff meetings. At least once a month, we do what we have to do, namely staff meetings, but in other places. So we call up schools, organizations, other workplaces, uh, and we ask them, can we use your meeting room? And it would be great if you could also tell us about what you're doing. Um, and we can maybe uh, tell you something about what's up at the Const Hall. And here you can see us um, doing that with one of the um, youth activities uh, in Tensta. What always happens in these situations is that we um, ask the people we meet uh, how the Const Hall can be interesting, meaningful, and even useful for them. And sometimes there is no interest. But um, in other cases, there is an immediate answer, like the Women's Center. They said, we want to make tea and coffee salons in your cafe. Uh, so for about three years now, every two or three months, these tea and coffee salons uh, do take place. They're often thematic. They're often to do with um, uh, cooking or baking or how to make coffee and tea and so on. The Women's Center is an interesting um, organization. It's supposedly the only multi-ethnic association in Tensta with about 250 members from many different countries, uh, primarily middle-aged and elderly women who do not come outside of their house very often. So the Women's Center, which rents uh, an apartment where they do language courses, uh, some cooking courses, uh, computer courses, etc., uh, has become a bit of an extended living room for this particular group. And we've found that they are one of our most uh, frequent and most beloved collaborators uh, ever since, not least because through them we got to know Fahima al Nabsi, the lady behind the reception desk, who was uh, a member of the board of the Women's Center. And we ended up hiring her as, her, as our receptionist. Uh, she's been living in Tensta for 20 years. She's a trained economist from Baghdad. 
She never got a job as an economist in Sweden. When she has been employed, it's been in childcare primarily, but she's often also been unemployed. And she knows more or less everybody in the neighborhood, and she's a bit of a social genius. So um, we're very lucky to have her. The cafe is another component, maybe the most important point of mediation in the whole structure. We're too small to run a cafe by ourselves. But when I came, I felt that not only is it always nice to have a cafe when you go to um, an art center or a museum, uh, but in Tensta there are no cafes. There are a few places where you can buy tea and coffee, but it's not necessarily uh, places where you want to hang out, and certainly not if you're a woman, because public space in general, including these places where you can buy tea and coffee, are, uh, tend to be very male-dominated. So we outsourced the cafe to a local social company whose purpose it is to create jobs, and primarily jobs for people living locally. And uh, they serve lunch and uh, coffee and so on. And it's become um, kind of a nice, um, uh, not meeting point necessarily, but a place where a lot of people uh, come. And it's also where we do uh, something that is replacing what you normally find in art institutions, which is uh, VIP receptions in conjunction with openings. We don't do these. Instead, we do our local lunches. So the day of the opening, we always organize a lunch where we invite collaborators, partners. Uh, we also <laughs> actually try and reach out to those who don't like us in the neighborhood, because uh, they, of course, exist too. Uh, so that um, everybody has a chance to meet with the artists. In this case, um, some of you might recognize the artist Celine Condorelli in the foreground, uh, who uh, participated in an exhibition that I will say a few, word about, a few words about in a moment. Like most art institutions today, we are required to do things targeting children. Um, we're very well aware of that the commercial art market has uh, boomed in the last 15 years, and Simultaneously, public funding in many parts of the world, particularly Northern Europe, um, has become more instrumentalized, meaning that there are strings attached to uh, the money we get. And more and more, in our case, it's to do with uh, doing things with children and youth, uh, which is fine. And we do lots of different things, which you find in many different places. Something which is a little bit more unusual is this case, the Art Gallery Club. When I started, I quickly found out that there was a group of 10-year-old girls who had started to come to the Konsthal on their own initiative a few months prior. They had just uh, found the Konsthal. They hadn't even been there with their teachers. And they liked the place. It was nice to hang out after, uh, after school. And when I arrived, I asked our mediator if she could think of a way of formalizing this a little bit so it wasn't just playing and running around. She sat down with them and they said, okay, we want to make uh, a club. We want to call it the gallery club. We want to meet every Wednesday afternoon. We want to do things related to what you're doing in the gallery. But we also want to do excursions to the city center. Even if it's not a big geographical distance between Tensta and um, the city center of Stockholm, um, any other distance is big. Uh, the economic distance, uh, the cultural dif distance, etc. Stockholm is considered uh, one of the most segregated um, cities in Europe today, with a primarily white and wealthy center and um, uh, colored and poor uh, suburbs or outskirts. So for, for, for a group like these girls, it's not self-evident that you go to the city center and certainly not to, to explore um, the activities that can be interesting for them. So this went on for about two years until they entered puberty. Then it wasn't interesting any longer. But they also split up. They weren't in the same class anymore. They went to different schools. But we're actually in touch with uh, a few of them individually. Um, so they've been reconnecting in different ways um, afterwards. So from this, you might think that we're primarily working locally, and we do that a lot. But I keep on insisting on that it's extremely important to also 
be part of an international discussion about what art does, uh, what curating does. So almost every season we have had a seminar series which is more, um, more directed towards a uh, profession, purely pr art professional uh, questions um, and the first one was what does an art institution do? Uh, in that case we collaborated with the uh, University College of Arts, Crafts and Design and uh, for each seminar we invited two people to talk about um, case studies. What you see here is Chus Martinez when she was the artistic director of uh, Documenta in Kassel. Um, an event that happens every five years and what does that mean in terms of locality to have such long distances between the big events together with Gavin Wade who's one of the directors of uh, Eastside Projects in Birmingham which is more like an artist-led uh, organization trying to cater to the community. Um, these series have uh, this one has been followed by, for example, uh, a seminar series called What Does Art Theory Do? which we did with Art History Department um, of the University. Uh, what Does Social Practice uh, Do? together with the Architecture School, uh, etc. But this thing with, with the location uh, is essential and we keep returning to it. And uh, it gelled in a project that started in 2013 called Tensta Museum Reports from New Sweden. And through this exhibition, which eventually became something much more, we wanted to play museum. We wanted to pretend that we are something bigger, something more stable, something more authoritative than we actually are, because in fact we're a brittle little private underfunded in foundation in the suburbs. Um, and we also wanted to talk about history and memory in the neighborhood in relation to people and in relation to uh, the place. And by doing so, we realized quickly that we would inevitably also give reports about what we call the new Sweden. New in the sense that in the last 20 years, Swedish society has transformed radically uh, in many different ways. It's uh, neoliberalized in ways that most people outside of Sweden um, are not aware of. Uh, the policies of, of uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, for instance, similar to those ones have, have been um, instigated in Sweden since the early 90s. And at the same time, a steady influx of migrants um, have uh, changed the demographics. But somehow, this is, um, these are facts that have not been fully discussed or acknowledged uh, domestically and are almost unknown internationally. So the new S Sweden might not be new uh, in effect, but it feels new because it hasn't really been uh, raised. So, clearly a big topic and we thought that this is not possible to deal with in a standard exhibition, neither in terms of uh, size nor in terms of time. So we decided to divide it into a fall department and a spring department. So, um, playing with the notion of what a department is. It doesn't have to be something spatial, right? It can also be related to time. Oops. Yeah, so the f um, fall department, the spring department, and as you can see, many different um, people and groups contributed to the project. From um, an architect who is specialized in the architectural uh, history of the place, who lent us his personal archive with photographs, uh, original drawings, newspaper clippings, uh, to a one-day symposium on the notion of cultural heritage, uh, assembled by the very interesting philosopher Boris Buden, who is based in Berlin but from Zagreb. And, uh, a number of local associations and organizations. Importantly, a lot of art. Um, 
This project by uh, Terence Gower looks at a late modernist housing estate in Mexico City. Tensta is not alone, obviously. Late modernist housing is a global phenomenon. And artists interested in this global phenomenon is also a global phenomenon. So uh, we decided to have a number of, of works uh, exemplifying this. It's work from uh, the mid-90s until today uh, became a red thread in the exhibition, like this beautiful little painting by um, Malmö-based artist uh, Victor Rostal. The exhibition uh, changed, so the fall department um, had certain projects that were kept uh, throughout the two departments, but others uh, were taken down. And uh, one of the ones that were uh, that was kept all along was a contribution by the local heritage association. Um, an association dominated by elderly people born in Sweden, um, Swedish identified, uh, who are not interested in the new neighborhood in Tensta but in the old rural history and who know perfectly everything about that and who are lovely people, and we um, asked them if, if they had some material in their archives that we could uh, show in the exhibition. And they immediately found um, images like this one. And they said, we have nothing from, from the modernist housing uh, period. And we prodded them, and eventually they actually did have something. So uh, this also became an interesting collaboration uh, thanks to the fact that they agreed to do a couple of presentations on old history uh, in Tensta, but they also agreed to discuss the notion of heritage. At what point do we actually have to include uh, the new neighborhood in the notion of uh, cultural heritage? And again, they've uh, returned as partners in different projects for us, and they are the most steady uh, guests at our local lunches uh, when we do them at the opening days. I cannot resist showing this one uh, because it's a favorite of mine since I was a kid and I was thrilled to be able to show it in Tensta. Uh, Josebeth Sjöberg uh, was um, a single woman living in the city center of Stockholm in the 19th century. She never married uh, which meant that she didn't have enough money to have her own household. So she rented rooms uh, in different apartments throughout her life. She earned a little bit of money by giving music lessons. And she documented her uh, rooms uh, with these beautiful watercolors. Um, she never went to art school, um, but she spent a lot of time uh, looking at her rooms, rendering them with as much detail as possible. Um, the area she lived in in the city center at that time was the place where newly arrived migrants would come, where the precariat of that time actually lived. So in a way, her watercolors, which belong to the collection of the Municipal uh, History Museum, um, talk about an existence very similar to what many people have in Tensta today. So that helped us also strike a chord in terms of one of the themes in Tensta Museum, which was precisely housing. And housing is one of the biggest topics in Stockholm in a different way than here. Uh, there are very few condos being built in Stockholm. Uh, and the crisis in terms of housing is that there is a complete lack of housing. Um, and whatever is there is extremely expensive. Uh, the artist Petra Bauer was invited as one of several artists to make a new work for Tansta Museum. She uh, teamed up with the Women's Center to uh, explore the politics of listening through a series of workshops slash seminars that they called ACTS that happened throughout the exhibition period, which was seven months all in all. And they all happened in one of the spaces of uh, Tensta Konsthal, they uh, workshopped how the space should be furnished. So, and they also knew that whatever was bought for this room where they would have their events, which would be closed for 
the members of the Women's Center that were interested, but also other participants who wanted to explore the politics of listening, they knew that the furniture would go to the Women's Center afterwards. So uh, now you can find these very chairs and so on um, in their rented apartment. And a lot of the, the s events to do uh, as part of this project touched on housing because it is a daily concern for uh, many people. Action Archive, Action Archive, you don't very often combine um, an archive with something which is uh, active or even activist, but this is an activist archive. Um, it's a, a group of three architects uh, in Stockholm who want to look at forgotten moments in local architectural history, and they've devised this module which can be folded and it's on wheels and it's made so that it actually fits in the elevators of the subway so it can easily be taken around uh, the city. And they found out that in the late 80s there was a big housing conference in Tensta convened by the municipality with the big names of the time thinking about n new ways of planning rather than uh, top-down, bottom-up policies. Um, it was written about uh, in the newspapers, there were television reports, it was a significant event. But when the architects uh, tried to look for it in local archives, they found nothing. Nothing in the city archive, nothing in the uh, local city administration archive. It simply vanished, for whatever reason. Maybe it's a coincidence, maybe not. But they set out to uh, collect material around this event, which actually was a turn in terms of how the city understood citizens' uh, influence on uh, policy making and decision making. Another example that uh, this group uh, did was a witness seminar with people who actually moved to Tensta in the late 60s, sharing their memories, something which is about to disappear because they're so old. And then this. A green bulletin board with printouts from the internet from somebody who's actually based in Edmonton. Do you know Amin Namir? Ask anybody connected to Somalia and they would know who Amin Amir is. Um, he um, is an artist and, and cartoonist. He has a website uh, where he comments on what is going on uh, in Somalia. And it has become... Um, sort of um, communication line uh, between people inside the country and people in the diaspora. Um, this came about in a rather interesting way. For me, <coughs> three weeks into my job, a person comes up to me with a hand scribbled note saying, look at this, it would be fantastic if you one day could do something with this artist. I eventually looked it up and it was Amin Amir's website. Not so interesting as art, I felt. Uh, but I kept the little note, and when we started to discuss Tensta Museum, it suddenly became uh, much more uh, interesting in the sense that what he's doing is that he's talking about um, a situation which is highly relevant for a big group living locally, and something that the rest of us know really little about. So, uh, with the Somali Association in Tensta, we organized um, a series of uh, family afternoons about representations of Somalia, taking uh, the work of, of Amin Amir as a starting point and also premiering for the first time in Sweden a Canadian documentary uh, about Amin Amir. Um, a few more examples. Um, the most interesting literature scene in Stockholm today, I would argue, are um, slam poets, very politicized slam poets, often with a background in the suburbs. Uh, so they were commissioned to make some new work uh, for us, which they uh, shared at the inaugurations of the different departments. We worked with the Kurdish Association, we worked with the senior high school and their uh, amazing art collection. And then, if you want to be a museum and you really take it seriously. You have to have branches, right? So we asked a couple of the big institutions in the city center uh, if we could open branches with them. And uh, 
both of them, the City Museum and the Museum of Medieval Stockholm, said yes, as long as we paid for everything. Which hurt a little bit, but um, what don't you do to sort of make a statement? So we commissioned artists to do work for these uh, branches. Um, and Katarina Lundgren, whom you can see here, has made over years fascinating research on the literal uh, historical heritage in terms of material uh, in dumps uh, created from torn down buildings in the city center from the 50s onwards. And as we were working on planning Tensta Museum, talking about branches, the local library called us and said, we are going to be renovated. Um, can we open a branch over at the Konsthall? We, of course, said yes. So for seven months, we had a little branch, uh, the corner that you can see here with children's literature and literature uh, on local history. So maybe that gives you uh, an idea of that things constantly go both ways. So uh, we have ideas reaching out to certain groups or people, but they also come back. And it's not that we always agree on, on their suggestions and ideas, but quite often it's really uh, uh, great uh, proposals that they come with. And one of those is also this, the last day of the exhibition. We had, um, or the last weekend of the exhibition, we had a national housing policy forum which was convened by a network of organizations and activist groups uh, who wanted to, unusually enough, debate housing policy in public. And it was uh, a great event um, that has led on to, to um, follow-ups in other cities. So once we had done Tensta Museum, the exhibition, over this seven-month period, there was still so much material that had surfaced, so we couldn't stop. And we still are doing Tensta Museum. There is always something in our program which is connected to Tensta Museum or which is Tensta Museum. So um, the summer after the big exhibition, we devoted half of the exhibition space to a classroom, which we called uh, Tensta Museum Classroom, uh, because the local school uh, teaching Swedish to migrants had contacted us saying, it's such a pity that you're closed in the summer, which we were, like many other art institutions in the city center. They thought it was a pity because they needed places to uh, be in the summer um, and also environments where you can practice your language beyond the classroom. And we thought that was rather interesting, so we decided for the first time in 10 years to stay open. And then they said, well, can't we have our uh, classes in the Konsthall. And in order for them to have their classes there, we had to have a classroom. So that's the logic. So again, this summer, they do their uh, Swedish uh, classes uh, uh, at the Konsthall. We also continued the line with artists dealing with late modernist housing, uh, with Jakob Kolding's posters. And a local architect working at the city planning office uh, knocked on the door saying, look at, look at what I have in this cardboard box. And it was rolls with original drawings by the planning architect Igor Dergalin, who actually did the master plan for Tensta, which he found in um, the city planning office about to be thrown away. And he salvaged them and asked if we wanted to show them. Here you can see just one of them. So this continues, as I said, uh, with uh, um, uh, the classes this summer, and uh, it includes excursions to the green area, the natural reserve, which is next door to Tensta. And Tensta Museum also continues through the art project, The Silent University, initiated by Ahmed Ögut, who is based between Istanbul and Berlin. Uh, it's an independent educational platform that wants to give voice to silenced knowledge, meaning primarily refugees um, and other migrants without the right legal status, uh, to practice their competence and use their education. So through the Silent University, which has happened in London and Berlin, uh, it uh, is possible, or Ahmed makes sure that uh, it's organized that certain people can do lectures and seminars and other things where they practice their knowledge. In 
Tensta, the continuation of this, we did such lectures at the beginning. The continuation is a language cafe, again run by uh, the eminent uh, Fahima Al Nabsi, um, the receptionist. So it started with one day a week on Sundays uh, with people who want to practice Swedish and, and Arabic, with her and Swedish speaking volunteers. And now um, the interest has been so big, so we've extended it to Fridays and Sundays. And here, uh, once a month, the Language Cafe does excursions to other places. So they went to the local Heritage Association, the sweet people who lent us their photographic material for uh, Tansta Museum. Um, we take turns, so I took them to a museum in the city center. And uh, uh, that was part of a, a group exhibition uh, called Abstract Possible, exploring abstraction and contemporary art which had evolved in different places, including Malmö, Mexico City, Zurich, Birmingham, and Stockholm, where um, I looked at abstraction through three lenses, formal abstraction, economic abstraction, and social abstraction, as in withdrawal strategies. Uh, abstrahere in Latin, of course, means to step aside. Whoops. And this idea of, of actually doing reports is quite, uh, quite appealing to us. So we have uh, worked together with a national network of small and medium-sized arts institutions pooling money to commission a report on what these kinds of institutions actually produce in terms of value to get away from uh, talking about visitor numbers, uh, budgets, uh, media attention. What other values do we actually produce? And this is thanks to a new network that we helped initiate called Klister. And I uh, put this up because I think it's important that right now there is a certain sense of mobilization when it comes to institutional work, at least in, in a European context. So, uh, Klister, the national network, is one, and it's very much about advocacy work and solidarity building and sharing of experience. Uh, Cluster, the third one, uh, is um, a European one where with art centers in suburban residential areas in European cities and one in Israel, in Holon, which is a suburb of Tel Aviv. And the other ones are um, networks that are around these days between museums or art centers, etc. And with uh, one of our networks, the smallest one, the sibling art centers in Stockholm, with four art centers in suburbs, and another local organization, we have started a preparatory art course uh, for young people, primarily from the suburbs, who might not have um, an easy access to, to culture broadly and contemporary art specifically. So it's a course that happens in the evening twice a month. And it uses the programs of these four art centers in the suburbs as their core activities. So it's about using what's already there and joining the dots. Maybe you don't have to start an education from scratch. Maybe it's enough to actually uh, call from what people are already doing and it's now running in its uh, second semester. And Cluster, uh, which has turned into a wonderful uh, resource and peer group, uh, we applied for a little bit of money so that we could travel to each other um, and learn on the ground how each organization is working, how we put together our program, how uh, the budget is working, but also decision-making uh, processes, and not least, what the neighborhoods mean and how we deal with the neighborhoods. And we, uh, the, it took two years to travel to each other, um, and we decided from the beginning not to work on something specific, but to get to know each other first. And uh, only when we had done that did we agree on that a book should be made uh, documenting this experience. So that's a book called Cluster a Dialectionary, which I also brought. 
And this is the final project that I will talk about, and I cannot resist it because it was so much fun to work on it, and because it doesn't really fit into the rest of the things that I've shown you. Uh, it's a historical project primarily, uh, with Frederick Kiesler. Uh, who knows the work of Frederick Kiesler? Yeah, some people. Um, it's a fascinating but forgotten figure. So don't worry if you don't know him. Most people don't. Although he was uh, friends with Duchamp and Breton and um, uh, Le Corbusier and you name it in terms of artists and architects uh, in the mid 20th century. He was practicing within architecture, art and theater, stage design primarily. He was also a prolific writer. And uh, he lived between 1890 and 1965. He was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, moved to New York in 26, where he stayed until uh, his death. My interest in, in him comes from him being um, more or less a revolutionary exhibition designer. His uh, um, display strategies uh, turned um, any convention around uh, from the 20s onwards. And we collaborated with the Frederick Kiesler Foundation in Vienna to make a, a survey or a monographic show, let's say, of his work spanning um, all the, the different areas that I mentioned. And in terms of the exhibition design, this is perhaps his tour de force, uh, the surrealist gallery of Peggy Guggenheim's private museum, Art of this Century, which opened in 1942 in Manhattan. Peggy Guggenheim had a pretty impressive collection, and she rented uh, a space on the seventh floor on 57th Street in Manhattan. It had been a tailor shop, and he, Kiesler, transformed it into four different rooms. And the most spectacular one was the Surrealist Gallery, and we had a model of the Surrealist Gallery in uh, the exhibition. As you can see, the walls were curved, made of wood. Um, the paintings were all taken out of their frames. Uh, Kiesler always felt that uh, frames were limiting. He wanted the space itself to be the framing device. He then uh, designed very particular wooden arms uh, to which the paintings were attached and which also allowed him to have different angles on the paintings. And uh, at the same time, he designed furniture. So what you can see in the middle and on the right are pieces of his um, so-called Korealist furniture, which he made for Peggy Guggenheim's Art of the Century, which are multi-purpose pieces that can be uh, podiums, they can be seats, they can be tables, um, etc. He's also known for the Endless House, um, which is uh, a shell uh, a self-bearing self shell construction that was never realized, um, but which has stayed within um, architecture history as a visionary example of how we can think housing differently. We could show gorgeous uh, drawings by him, thanks to the Kiesler Foundation, and also his uh, really interesting writing. He was uh, a bit of a theoretician, and on the top left-hand side, you can see a spread with Duchamp's large glass. Uh, that's the first text ever published in the US on Duchamp's work by Kiesler, uh, which focused precisely on the large glass. We invited Celine Condorelli, the artist and architect, to work with us on the show to uh, filter it, to frame it. She is an artist, she is a person, a, <laughs> a cultural producer with a long standing interest in display structures and what she calls support structures. So she was the ideal person to engage with Kiesler's work uh, that she has been familiar with for uh, a long time. So she contributed a sculpture, uh, but also a stage uh, in the middle of the space, a circular stage, which uh, referenced uh, one of Kiesler's own um, stage designs from 1924, which was a circular uh, stage elevated to which uh, the actors came by uh, climbing a ramp. 
And on this uh, stage by Celine Condorelli, we had all the public events of the exhibition in the middle of the exhibition space, almost like a heart. And finally, this is my last slide. Uh, six student groups helped annotate the project, ranging between uh, design students and architecture students to a fifth grade in the neighborhood. So in various ways, they engaged with Kiesler's work starting in September of 2014 and the show opened in February 2015. And their uh, projects were presented inside the exhibition on these wooden structures, which are replicas of Kiesler's own groundbreaking exhibition design from 1924 in Vienna, the so-called T and L system, replicas made by one of the student groups. So the annotations, the contributions by the students were um, concentrated on these uh, replicas of his own uh, display structures. So I'd like to end by um, saying something er about what the uh, anthropologist Mary Louise Pratt uh, discussed in a text in the 90s, uh, namely uh, contact zones. And she uses this term to describe um, social spaces where various cultures collide and try to deal with each other, often through asymmetrical relations of power. And in her, uh, text, uh, she's referring to uh, contexts that uh, involve colonialism and slavery and the repercussions of them. Um, but she also importantly uses the term to reconsider prevalent models of community, um, the way they appear both in academic and social work. And I found uh, this actually quite interesting um, because the, the contact zones, according to her, uh, always also involve uh, auto-ethnographic auto material, that is uh, text, images, and other documents in which people describe themselves. So it's a way of, of uh, dealing with the representations that others make of them, as well as uh, material produced by people who do not live and work in a particular context. Um, and certainly a contact zone is also a conflict zone. Um, I did not show you um, a slide which I'm often using, uh, which shows the glass window of the cafe taped up because it was, the photo was taken the day after our latest break-in. Over the years, there have been many break-ins. And the latest one, which happened about three years ago, happened in the middle of the night. Um, the, the guards came eight hours after the alarm went off. And at that time, all the money from the cafe was gone, plus all the cookies. <laughs> and I think that says a little bit about uh, the situation that we work in. Thank you. So I'd be happy uh, with comments and questions. I see that there is a mic here. There is one. Thanks for that, Maria. Um, in the last few I positions... I don't think we can hear you, right? Hello. There we go. Thank you for that. Um, the past two positions that you've had, this one in Tensta and then before that at the Center for Curatorial Studies, seem to be in areas that are just outside of city centers, so sort of position on the periphery of what seem to be uh, major cities for art production and cultural production. I wonder if you can speak a little bit to positioning the institutions on those peripheries and your curatorial practice within those sorts of locations. I tend to think that most of the things I've done um, are off the beaten tracks. They're a bit off center um, 
in the first place working in Stockholm is considered far away and uh, <laughs> peripheral by most people um, in the art world and, and otherwise too. And Tensta is sort of the periphery of the periphery in that sense. Um, I, I like that. That's more interesting to me because uh, it tends to give you m more um, space to maneuver. You're not guarded the same way you might be if you're uh, right in the limelight, so to speak. Um, yeah. I'm, tr I'm trying to think what, what the difference is. Well, Bard, of course, was a rural environment. That's um, a major difference. But I can see also some similarities. As you remember, I, I thought it was important for the students when they came to the Center for Curatorial Studies to get to know not only the campus, but also the area around uh, the college. And that was met with some resistance. But I think it's... Uh, uh, not only uh, important, but also very rewarding to do these things. Thank you, Maria, for your talk. Um, I love the way your institution is so porous and responsive to the needs of your community. Um, but at the same time, you mentioned your limited staff and resources and even space. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about, can you hear me? Yeah, about your decision-making process. How do you decide what to take on and what not to take on? Because you can't you know, be all things to all people. Very good question. In terms of, of the artists we work with, um, it's me deciding. Um, there is a board. Uh, consisting of uh, six or seven people. Um, they don't interfere at all uh, in the program. They're very hands-off, but it's also not a board that contributes to fundraising, for instance. Their big uh, skills um, are knowing how to uh, navigate public administration, let's say, and partly also um, the media. Um, the team it's actually not primarily people with a curatorial background. Um, two of the team members are um, trained as art teachers. Uh, somebody who also used to practice for a short time as a photographer and who also took art history. Um, it, what they contribute in terms of content is, is more thinking about how to mediate things. And that becomes often projects in and of themselves. Um, so each team member, even if it's, yeah, like, like the receptionist Fahima, she has her projects, like the language cafe. And she also suggested that we do something uh, that uh, we now call citizen to citizen, which is a very uh, down to earth, basic uh, support for newly arrived migrants who may not know how to contact the right person in the city administration or what doctor to call and so on. So they, it's a drop-in um, model on Tuesday, so they can just come and they ask for help with different things. Maybe sometimes it's just about formulating a letter. Um, other members of staff do other things, so somebody uh, who's very connected to uh, the vegan uh, community in Stockholm. She suggested that we do uh, vegan brunches the last Sunday of every month. So she has put her heart into that and it's become really excellent. Um, and uh, somebody else um, really wanted to work with, the Tariq At with Tariq Atui, the artist and musician who some of you maybe saw in Documenta in 2012. Uh, he was part of Tensta Museum and his project working with local musicians to explore the musical identity of the neighborhood has continued thanks to one of the team members really being engaged with that project and wanting to, to carry it further. Community members that are coming in and bringing, you know, propositions to 
often we discuss it in the team and the final decision is always with me. Um, but because not all the other team members, but most of them are more connected to, to the neighborhood on a daily basis than I am, their words weigh really heavily. They are the ones with, with the real competence in many ways. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a fairly organic process. I will, I would say. I like very much uh, the way in which uh, local community. Can you maybe speak up a little, please? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I very much appreciate the way in which uh, community uh, around Tensor Council especially the minorities, are integrated in a way, uh, or not so much integrated because it's, that's not an appropriate word, but uh, invited to contribute, their contribution is valued. And, uh, and how it happens on a very human scale. Uh, Toronto is a city where we have, uh, it's a city of immigrants and I'm one of them. Um, I, I mean, my own experience uh, when I came here, and that was several years ago, was, you know, just being pretty much left to my own devices. And I see a lot of that happening um, in Toronto in general. Refugees and immigrants from other countries come and they live in their own little ghettos and they don't really participate in the life of cultural institutions. And I. And I'm very inspired by the fact that this could be a role that a cultural, that a cultural institution in a city like ours could really take. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, a comment in, in relation to that is that I don't think there is any formula to these things. Um, and I think it is specific to every location and the dynamic of each place and, and time, of course. Um, one thing that was brought up yesterday at the workshop around collaboration, which I uh, mentioned was that from our main funder, the municipality of Stockholm, uh, there are certain um, requirements in terms of groups to address and so on, but more and more there are also um, wishes that we should collaborate with particular groups locally. And I find this terrible. And I do everything I can to resist it, uh, because most of the time it's not the right groups. And it's also somehow uh, a sign of that they don't see how much we already do it. It's a bit ridiculous to come and say that we should collaborate even more. <laughs> uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. I wanted to ask you, um, it's just a reflection, how uh, things are changing in the art institutions, no? You talk about uh, how the parameters for evaluating the performance of your institution deviate from uh, how many tickets you sell, how many blockbuster shows you do, the things that have killed uh, our local uh, regional galleries or big museums that have become almost uh, tourist uh, hubs, uh, temples for people to arrive at New York and uh, go p uh, for mass uh, at, uh, at MOCA or at the Guggenheim, but this is a different type of conceptualization of an institution. No? So what, uh, the, the comment uh, is more on the question of how do you see the evolution of this transformation of the institution and how are the communities of artists who work in more traditional practices being incorporated or phased out of that uh, f form of practice. Um, that interests me uh, because at some level 
your institution uh, operates almost like a community center. And at one point, I'm a psychiatrist, and at one point you sounded to me like a case manager. And you know, I took my clients to the cafe, I took them to the city, I helped them uh, be more, uh, learn social skills. And I thought that was very interesting, you know, how you began crossing the boundaries between an art institution and a community center, a, a case manager, etc. That's a very relevant uh, question. Uh, two reflections to start with. Um, if you think about the big, more mainstream institutions and their ways of operating, the mechanisms that rule them these days with blockbuster shows, etc. Um, among the things that I, I have presented tonight, um, a couple of things are present at the Museum of Modern Art in New York at the moment. For example, the work of Frederick Kiesler and something by Dominique Gonzalez Furster. So we work with some of the same artists, uh, but in radically different ways, apparently. Um, for me, it's uh, extremely important to be able to work with what I think is the best contemporary art, the most sophisticated, the most difficult, the most challenging contemporary art. Uh, because I don't see a contradiction between that and doing it in a place like Tensta. Only the best is good enough for a place like Tensta. There should be research centers, there should be universities in neighborhoods like this. Um, and the, the driving <laughs> force, so to speak, for me is that I, I think it's so important that contemporary art is a form of understanding, uh, perhaps more fascinating than any other that we have at our hands today in terms of trying to make sense of what's going on around us. And that this is something that should be um, available. It doesn't mean that we should throw it after people. That's not the point at all. But it's about allowing these things to sit next to each other. So to have um, an exhibition with Frederick Kiesler next to homework assistance, it doesn't mean that the kids necessarily uh, look very much at the show, but there is something going on. So this parallelity uh, tends to become more and more important for me. And what has happened also over the last year or year and a half is that uh, more and more local groups contact us asking if they can use the space just for meetings, like a local lobby group against a new highway or a group of retired people who like to write and who want to meet once a month to share their writing with each other. They call themselves the writing itch. Um, so th th this idea that things live in close proximity with one another. And it's totally okay that they don't intermingle. Maybe eventually they partly will, maybe not. And all this is also a symptom of a larger societal condition where the social welfare state has uh, retracted. So a lot of the services that were there are not there anymore, like spaces to meet. Nothing we do cost anything. There's no entrance fee. Um, you have to pay in the cafe, of course, but otherwise uh, uh, nothing costs. We would charge if a company wanted to use our space, and we have charged. It doesn't happen very often, but then we're happy to do so. Here is, it's hard to see in the dark, but I think there was there, yes. Hi, uh, I was interested, I suppose, in some ways in thinking about the time that you take to develop these projects and the partnerships and also the kind of trust. And Can in you some speak ways, up, sorry, a development of relationships with lots and lots of different types of groups and different individuals, whether or not that's artists, community members, other forums, and how sometimes it has maybe a particular research inquiry as part of that. But I suppose specifically thinking about this question of how you decide on an exhibitionary moment, or at what point something becomes visible, or do you sometimes decide that it should be invisible? When something is allowed to be invisible? Uh, that's a good one. I'm thinking if there is something which is invisible right now, it's not that something is um, 
consciously, constantly invisible. It's more about when something becomes visible. Um, as with almost any commissioned work, I would say. Um, well, maybe th this, it's not invisibility, it's a certain opaqueness, which is not completely impenetrable. Uh, the, the Citizen to Citizen project I mentioned, it's not public in the sense that an audience comes to it. It's mentioned on our website that people can come. And uh, most of the time it's of course people who want some kind of help. But one day, um, a fairly agitated man in his mid-40s uh, rushed in and asked, uh, when is Citizen to Citizen starting today? Uh, and it turned out that he was a member of uh, the extreme right Sweden Democrats, which is a racist party now having 30% of the votes uh, in Sweden. And uh, he wanted to pick a fight in relation to migration. Um, somehow we managed to defer him. Um, but that made us think, should we really have this on, on the website? Or should we just do it word by mouth? Thank you for your talk. Uh, it was good to hear about the history of the institution a bit because I followed what the... I'm sorry, I'm afraid <coughs> I'm going completely deaf. Can you hear me now? Now can I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you for your talk. It was good to hear about the history of Tensta and the institution because I know a little bit about the exhibitions program there, but of course a lot of what happens there isn't in the exhibitions program, so that was good to see. Uh, my question is about the kind of pressure uh, to perform, the kind of demand to perform on all cultural producers, whether it's artists or curators. And of course there's a lot of pressure on you at the institution because it has a limited budget and it's a small staff, but at the same time there, I mean you do uh, other projects because you want to as a curator, but of course there's also probably pressure on you professionally somewhat to do that as we all have. And I know you're doing your uh, the director curator for the Guangzhou Biennale coming up and I was curious uh, because so much of what you've done in Tensta is about building institutional building with a new team etc cetera, etc cetera. and when you do projects in other places is, is, is it important that you take the methodologies and what you've developed in Tensta with you, with you or is it important to separate that or is it a dialectic between the two I was just curious for your as a curator for your practice how you negotiate that because it's such a very specific context you're working with in Tensta then in Guangzhou, I mean that Biennale has a very specific political history, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you negotiate the uh, moving between institutions as a curator? Thank you. Um, because I tend to work very situationally or as I have said many times, context sensitively. Um, it's a bit eclectic. It depends on the place and the time and, and uh, the situation. So, uh, for instance, when I worked at the Modern Museum in Stockholm in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was no concern with mediation at all from my side. Um, I was completely busy making new works possible uh, in ways that I did not see happen enough around me in terms of providing a certain kind of support structure for the artist with budgets uh, to produce and fees and um, catalogs and so on. Um, and I think that was a moment for many of the curators of my generation where it was important to explore certain uh, intra-art uh, methodologies. The the big turning point in terms of mediation for me came actually when I was at Bard. And when I realized that many of the fantastic students there had very little interest in whom they could have an exchange around the projects they were doing. So there was a focus on the project and the artist and themselves, but not how art sits in culture or how art lands in a certain situation. And that became increasingly frustrating for me and I of course realized that I was doing the same often. 
And um, having a background also as, a, as an educator, I've been working as a guide in many different capacities uh, throughout my life, and I've been teaching you know, since the late 80s and so on. Um, it became more interesting for me to think about how to mediate work, how art sits in culture. Uh, also, observing what is happening with the art world in terms of the, the, on the one hand, increased exclusivity, and on the other hand, the diluted uh, quality, if you wish, of a lot of things that we see in the um, more mainstream institutions. So a desire to actually try and tease out uh, more of the great work that is around. And I think now that's what I'm taking with me partly to Guangzhou. Interestingly enough, the Guangzhou Biennial, which uh, was founded in 1995 and which then had a building built for it, is located in a residential neighborhood. Did that answer your question? I would think that any project would also somehow contribute to the lineage or the history or whatever. But I think what you're after is whether I, I'm interested in um, embedding uh, this version of the biennial locally in similar ways to Tensta. Partly, yes, but not entirely so. I would very much like also to uh, treat um, parts of the exhibition space as wide cube type exhibitions. That is also a long-standing concern of mine, to think about how things are articulated in space and how you actually install an exhibition, what kind of experience you have inside an exhibition. I have to say I was rather shocked at the Art Gallery of Ontario uh, with the Thompson collection and the wooden bars in front of the works. Um, so I think quite a lot about that, and I'm looking forward to being able to explore some of it in Guangzhou, because the exhibition uh, space is really big, so it's fly, five, two buildings, um, altogether five floors, and it's quite, quite big, and the idea of um, the installation is, is exciting to me. Here is one. Yes, hello. Oh. Can you hear me? Hello? Am I good? Yeah? Um, thank you for the, the talk. Uh, it was very generous um, to get an overview of Tensta. Um, uh, uh, one takeaway that I have is, is uh, the role or um, uh, the, the, the role of uh, sus suspicion uh, between the communities, between Tensta Constal and uh, perhaps the, 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 the communities that are being invited in. Um, I, I think I, I, I sort of, uh, upon reviewing what it is that you're saying, what it is that you're showing us, is that um, I, I, this is me in general as well, that I, 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 I feel suspicious of, of the space um, for inviting in um, 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 people from, not from Sweden. Um, so I'm just sort of curious, uh, um, perhaps you can comment on that, but also I'm also curious what has sort of shaped um, your, your uh, positioning of the Constal uh, in relation to this um, um, sus possible sp suspicion between these two communities. Uh, I'm sort of interested in the relationship of, of, of that. And the two communities being? The, you and your institution and the Arabic community um, that, that are coming into the area. 
I think there is uh, quite an amount of suspicion and even hostility uh, at the same time as there are other kinds of uh, relationships and feelings. Um, I don't think it's as simple as two different communities um, opposing each other. There are many different groups and many different interests and stakes. A number of the team members live in Tensta. Some of them have lived there for a long time, uh, longer than many of the other inhabitants of the neighborhood. So it's a bit more complex than that. Um, uh, and it doesn't mean that everybody is invited all the time. We also say no. And a number of, of um, uh, there are also a number of cases where uh, there hasn't been an interest when we have uh, suggested something to them. So it's, it's much more messy, I would say. But uh, to me it's always interesting that the biggest skepticism comes from the art scene. How so? Yeah, you tell me. Why is that? As if it shouldn't be possible. I'm not saying that everything is working and that everything is great, but certain things actually do work quite interestingly. Let's think about this. And I want to mention one thing, and that is that we never use labels in our exhibitions. Um, instead, we have handouts. Uh, with the same kind of information that you would find on a on a work label, uh, s plus additional, you know, facts and often also a conversation with the artist in question, and um, we would never be able to do something like this to print enough if it wasn't for the uh, tremendous uh, graphic designers Meta Haven. It's a duo in Amsterdam. They not only helped us develop uh, what we call the mark, I asked them if it would be possible to communicate without a logo. Can we somehow not be fully implicated in branding culture? We want to be recognizable, but at the same time we don't really want to play along 100%. So they suggested that um, we would have a mark instead of a logo. So. To begin with, the mark should be a square, but that could also change. And inside the, uh, the square, it should always say Tensta Constal. But for every handout, uh, the way Tensta Constal is written is different because it's taken from uh, a different context. And the reference where it's taken from is always quoted in the upper right-hand side. So it's also a way of uh, disclosing the um, immaterial infrastructure of the institution, uh, blinking at uh, Centre Pompidou in Paris where the physical infrastructure of the sewage and the water pipes and even the escalators are clearly uh, shown um, in uh, the building itself. So it's um, a mutating mark, let's say. And um, a new thing for this year, you might not see it here, but you can pick up, I have some copies here, is that the square is sort of eaten at. There is a chew uh, on the bottom and, and on top as well. So things are um, uh, changing in, in, in modest ways. And what I wanted to say is that it would only be possible for us to do this. Uh, it is only possible because of Meta Haven's idea that we produce these things in-house. We pre uh, print, offset print the paper, gorgeous designs by them that changes all the time. So it's the cheapest possible way of producing something that uh, we actually can offer to uh, each visitor, which I also like to think is a design object. Thank you. <laughs>